couple of weeks ago, I uh, shared with you that I had uh, flown with my two granddaughters, Addie, who's five, and Bria, who's three, uh, over for vacation. We met Diane. She was already over there. We went to uh, southern Missouri, Lake of the Ozarks area, so kind of rural Missouri. And uh, on the first uh, day, uh, we played hard in the morning, and then the three-year-old, Bria, needed to take a nap, and we wanted to make sure she got it because her parents were coming in a couple days, and we didn't want to break the rules. And and, uh, and while Bria was napping, Addie was sitting outside just reading and playing. And, and uh, when I walked out, she said, Papa, can I have your iPad? I want to get a movie. And uh, so I gave her my iPad. And like any five-year-old, she scrolled through. She found the app she wanted. She got on uh, Amazon, downloaded a movie. And five minutes later was watching a movie. And my five-year-old granddaughter, Addie, thinks... That's how it's always been done. <laughs> That's how everybody gets their movies. It's been this way since the dawn of time. This is how people get their stuff. Now, some of you, a few of you in this room are old enough to remember that how you got a movie was you waited till ABC, NBC, or CBS showed the movie. I mean, if you were sick the night they showed Wizard of Oz, you lost out. You didn't get to see it. You had to wait a whole other year before you got to see that movie. And then came uh, the debate between uh, VHS and Beta, and you remember how that debate went. And then we went to DVDs, and then it was Blockbuster, and you could go to Blockbuster, and there were thousands of movies. You could browse for a long time and, and then buy popcorn on the way out to go home and watch the movie. And it was great. For a few dollars, you could rent it for a few days, and if you didn't turn it back in, they charged you like $800,000 to buy the stupid thing. But. And then we went to Redbox, and... Now it's Netflix and DVR stuff. How we're getting our content shifted today. How things are being delivered to us. Right here in our own community, there are four blockbuster locations that six months ago were an active, vibrant store. And then without them realizing it, somehow, boom, their entire market disappeared. It was gone. They went bankrupt. And, and there are over uh, 16, 18,000 retail locations that house the blockbuster that are now are empty. Didn't see it coming somehow. Missed the turn. And if we're not careful, that's exactly what's happening to the big C church in America today. And that somehow we're missing out on what's going on around us. We've missed the huge cultural shift that has occurred in how people are connecting with things today. And somehow we, we may wake up one morning and discover... There's buildings that are empty with maybe a few gray-haired people who attend. You've heard these stats before. North America is the only continent where Christianity isn't growing. 66% of people in America, according to Gallup, find the church has little or no value for them. And somehow we have allowed ourselves to disconnect from, from our community. We, we have disengaged in so many ways. We've backed up and backed up and backed up and backed up. We've been more content to be about getting together in the room than we have about being the church in our community. Now, don't mistake, I think when we gather together, it matters. I, I think it's a biblical uh, command and mandate for us to gather together. I think there's something that happens when we gather together. I appreciate what happens when we gather together. But, but somehow we've made this is what church is about, what God's invited us to, called us to. We do our thing, we check it off our list, and God's inviting us to more than that. There's a mistaken notion that in 1917, Lenin issued a law that Christianity would be illegal in Russia, what would become the Soviet Union. But that's not what he did at all. What he declared illegal was for Christians to do anything other than gather together in their places of worship. They could no longer serve in their community. They could no longer do good things to meet the needs of people around them. They could no longer be engaged in acts of kindness and mercy and justice in their community. They could still gather to worship. They just weren't allowed to do anything outside it. And in less than 70 years, the church disappeared. Because God is inviting us, calling us to get engaged. Those words that Tim read earlier in Isaiah 58. Here's what God is saying. I'm tired of your religious stuff. Because your religious stuff is actually meaningless to me. 
the way you fast, the way you gather, the way you pretend to honor. And that what matters to me is whether or not you're caring and engaged. Echoing the words of Jesus' half-brother James when James says this, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and flawless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the word. The heart of biblical faith is justice. The heart of biblical faith is that you and I have a social conscience and we're engaged. And somewhere over the years, in the big C church, we've lost that. And here's what we've relegated it to. There are, there are liberal religious groups that hung on to social service. They found ways to get engaged and be helpful. They gave up on the gospel. They gave up on Jesus being uh, the Son of God. They gave up on, uh, on us uh, giving our hearts to Him. But we ought to do good stuff. And, and then over here in another corner are those who held on to biblical truth and the veracity of Scripture and, and Jesus as God's Son and Him being the only way for us to discover grace through God. But we gave up on serving. And nowhere in the Bible are those two things disjointed from each other, disconnected. In fact, they're like two wings to an aircraft. Good news and good deeds go together. And God is saying to us, if all you're doing is the religious stuff, ticking a few boxes off the list, you pray, you, you gather together, you read, you sing, but you are not caring about what I care about then what you have is not faith. It's something else. At the heart of biblical faith is a sensitive social conscience and engagement in the needs of the world around us as biblical justice. The writer of Proverbs, Solomon, says, He who oppresses the poor shows contempt for his maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Over and over in Scripture, there is this invitation, this command, this demand for us to get engaged in what's happening around us. Richard Stearns wrote a phenomenal uh, little book called The Hole in the Gospel. The Hole in the Gospel. And here's what he did. Some of his friends, they got together and they took their Bible and they went through the Bible and they underlined all the places in the Scripture that God said something about taking care of the poor, helping the disenfranchised, meeting the needs of, of people. And then they went back with a razor blade and everywhere they'd underlined, they cut that out of their Bible. And he said, our Bible barely held together at that point. He said, there was a tremendous hole in our Bible at that point. And somehow... The reason I believe we've lost so much ground in our society in so many ways is, is what Lenin decreed we've done by default. We've disengaged and disengaged. We've backed up. And we've lost the ability to be real people with real faith in a real world. Now, there are a whole lot of issues surrounding that, and there are a whole lot of circumstances involved. But I think one of the things we've done is we've been content to gather, and we've made the gathering the big deal, and we've made the gathering the experience, and we've created such a consumer-oriented thing, haven't we? This is what I want. This is what I need. This makes me feel good. That's why I come. And don't misunderstand, I think there's good stuff that happens when we gather. I like what happens most of the time I leave here encouraged. Occasionally a conversation out in the lobby leaves me less than that. But most of the time, <laughs> gathering is helpful and beneficial to us. But that's not the only deal. I think we have a responsibility to take the gospel that never changes, that message of Jesus, the same today, yesterday, and forever. That message of grace and hope and promise through Christ. The gospel that never changes to a world that is never going to be the same. And I think the best way for us to be able to deliver that content today is for us to get close enough to the needs going on to serve and engage, to do good deeds. And from that, we get the opportunity maybe to share uh, good news. Biblical justice matters. Now, in our culture today... We're very much like the group in Isaiah. The conversation they were having with God. Look at verse 3. Why have we fasted, they say, and you haven't seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you haven't noticed? Hey, we're doing all the right religious stuff and you aren't paying any attention to us. That's what they were complaining to God about. We're doing good things. Don't you see? 
And here's what God says to them. I find no pleasure, no pleasure in your sacrifices, in your religiosity. I find, I get no delight from that. I find nothing to honor there. You're doing the religious stuff and you have missed the heart of religion and relationship with me. And Jesus Drawing from Isaiah 58, particularly around verses 5, 6, and 7, actually makes the same parallel connection when you get over to the book of Matthew. If you have your Bibles, flip forward to Matthew chapter 25. Here's what's happening in Matthew 25. In Matthew 24, Jesus gets asked a question. And the question is this. When is judgment coming? When's the end of the world? We want to know when time is going to end and God's going to show back up and things are going to be made right and settled. Uh, we want all, that, that's a popular question. It's been a popular question for several years. When is the world going to end? When's God coming back? That's, that's popular today. And every time there's a crisis in somewhere in the world, you know, everyone, oh, we must be closer. Or, or we get one of those harvest moons, gets a little tin of red in it because of the pollution we've got in our air. Oh, we've got the blood moon. We're kind of, I mean, I, okay, great. <laughs> all I know is we're a little closer today than we are yesterday, and God has said to me, hey, don't focus on that. In fact, Jesus tells three stories in response to that question. When are things going to end? The first story is about bride, bridesmaids and, and a bridegroom. And, and, and the encouragement to the bridesmaids, hey, just be ready. Be prepared. Pay attention. And then the second story is about a master who took some of his estate and he shared it with three servants. And he trusted them with some abilities. And he said, I'm going on a journey and someday I'm coming back. And I'm going to hold you account for what you did. In other words, are you engaged? Are you connected? Are you, are you using what you have? And then the third story has to do with sheep and goats. And in that story, basically, you want to land on the sheep's side of the fence uh, in that story. Because here's what Jesus is saying. There are uh, wicked people and, and righteous people. They're sheep and goats. And here's what he says to the goats. Matthew 25, down in verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed in the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't look after me. Exactly paralleling those words in Isaiah 58. And here's what Jesus is saying. If you don't have justice... You don't have me. If you're not engaged in the needs going on around you, you have faith, but an, in, an unbiblical faith. If you're not finding a way to serve the disenfranchised, then, then what you have is not what I am inviting you to. And, and so the people debate him here. The response they give to Jesus, whoa, 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 hey. Hey, Jesus, when did we see you like that? I mean, we showed up at church and we sang songs to you and we worshiped and we read the Bible, we prayed, we, we tried to do, we tried to live a good moral life. We tried to, we tried to have the, the gospel change us somehow. When did we see you like that? We missed that one. Hey, I, if I'd have seen it, I'd have done it. <laughs> and, and, and there's that great verse from Jesus, that great line. Whatever you have not done for one of the least of these, you haven't done for me. So here's this message over and over and over from the beginning of the, God, uh, of the Bible all the way to the end of, of the book of Revelation. There's this thread that God is weaving about restoring us to himself, but for a greater purpose. And that's to be engaged, to care about the stuff he cares about, to get involved in that stream going by the front door. And maybe, maybe because we've lost serving and doing good and being engaged in the real issues around us, maybe that's why. The church is losing so much ground. Because maybe we haven't been engaged in justice. So what is justice? Well, our Western, predominant, cultural view of justice is this. We just want life to be fair. As long as it's fair for you and fair for me, however things pan out. I mean, after all, if you didn't do something with what you had, that's not my problem. We just want things to be fair, equitable. We want to kind of all have an equal start somehow. And when we see some major injustice, we, we get a little angry about that. But sometimes, most times, it doesn't actually motivate us to do much more than complain or whine about some of the bad stuff happening. In fact, our, our view of injustice in the West is actually even further than just that life should somehow be fair for us. 
It's actually about individual rights. In other words, I, I want what I want. I want things to work out for me. I want my opinion. I want to live my life the way I think I should live my life. And it really doesn't matter what others think. It really doesn't matter how it impacts the group. I'm going to do what I want to do because that's, that's just. It's my life. But that is not the biblical view of justice. The biblical view of justice, and I want to thank uh, Tim Keller, uh, the pastor at uh, Redeemer Presbyterian Church in uh, New York City, who's a friend of LifeBridge, uh, by the way, who, who helped help just give me some language, uh, probably 15 years ago around some of this, how I uh, saw some of these issues. Now, he said the biblical word for justice is rooted in the expansive notion of shalom, the Hebrew concept of shalom. Now, we know the word shalom means peace. But it's way more than that. It's not just peace. It's not a lack of trouble. It's not a lack of, of uh, anxiety or stress. Peace isn't just that things are settled. The Hebrew idea of shalom goes much further. It is this idea that there is this interconnectedness. There is, there is this greater whole. They were not simply individual threads getting to do what we want to, but we are woven together in a greater fabric. Theologian Neil Planting says it like this. Shalom is the webbing together of God, humans, and all of creation in equity and fulfillment and delight. That's what the Hebrews prophet called shalom. There was this interconnectedness. In other words, anywhere where part of the fabric was weak, everyone was connected to that. And it impacted them as well. That it wasn't just about the individual. It was what happened connected together. That, that we are interdependent, so to speak. Now this isn't the idea of some kind of socialism thing. But rather that we impact each other. We're connected together. And the Bible says we not only are connected, but we have an obligation for each other. Theologian... Um, a biblical scholar, Old Testament scholar, uh, Richard Walkey, defining how the Hebrews saw certain words, ta talked about it, illustrates it this way that, that I think was helpful to me. He talked about how the Bible continually speaks of righteous people and wicked people. And here's what uh, the Hebrews meant. He said, a righteous person sees what they have as part of the community and disadvantages themselves, disadvantages themselves for the greater whole. In other words, if they have something and somebody has need, they, they feed them. If somebody's without shelter, they try to figure out how to help. If somebody's missing a coat, they try to give them clothes. That's what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 25. But the wicked person, Walkie, Bruce Walkie says, is the one who sees their stuff as all theirs. This is mine. I've got mine. You get yours. And this biblical idea of justice means we go where the fabric is breaking down. And so, if I don't share what I have with others, it isn't just being selfish or maybe even just stingy. It is actually, from a biblical perspective, it is me being unjust. Okay, if you've hung in with this this long and you're not thinking about, man, lunch soon... And you've caught anything that I've been communicating. Here's what you should be saying. Uh-oh. <laughs> or worse, great. One more thing to add to my list. One more thing I'm going to Now, i, I got to be a good person. I'm supposed to go to church. i got to get in a group. i got to read the Bible. i got to pray. And now i got to do some other stuff too. Great. But if you and I are doing stuff to check off a list, if we're doing it because we're like guilty, right? And I get it. I'm a pastor. I've been doing this a long time. I get guilt. <laughs> I know how that works. <laughs> I will pile the guilt on, right? And we all, so I need a person. God. And then tomorrow we go back to doing what we're doing. Guilt, Keller says this, guilt is not enough to do anything other than restrain our heart. It doesn't change our heart. And God is inviting me to something bigger than just feeling bad about this stuff. Being guilty that I knew. In fact, 
here's really what's happening in our culture today. That list of things we're doing for God, most of us are doing it for us. We're consumers. This makes me feel better. This helps me with some stuff in my life. This makes me kind of, uh, uh, it just helps. Uh, I'm good with the help part. I want help too. But guilt isn't going to change me. Grace is going to change me. And when I allow God's grace to flow into my heart and change my mind. Here's what the Bible says. I get a different way I see the world. And I'm not responding because I feel so guilty. I'm responding because I want to respond with the very heart of God. And I want to care about what he cares about. And, and, and I'm disturbed by things that don't seem right. And by people who get preyed on or who, who are left outside. Who And I want to be a part. Grace ought to be flowing through us. But we've made... The Christian message in America today almost too much about what's in it for me. Now, I rarely talk about other people's ministries. In fact, can't think of very many times I have. But when something makes the news, it hits CNN and MSNBC and Fox and it's a big enough thing. And there's a lot of dialogue going on uh, this week about controversy with Joel Osteen and his wife and some things that were said. And Joel Osteen uh, pastors the largest church in America, and they've got a phenomenal ministry, and they do a lot of significant things. But part of his message is that God is going to give you whatever you really want, whatever dream you have. He wants you to have your dream. He wants you to be happy. He wants your life to work. He, he wants you to experience personal happiness and contentment and joy. And if you just follow God, those things are going to line up for you. Now, don't, don't misunderstand. I want to be happy. I, I think you ought to have dreams. I think there's things you ought to be passionate about and pursue. And I'm pretty sure if you're not positively thinking about those things, they're probably not going to happen for you. So positive thinking is a good thing. I'm not sure it's necessarily the biblical message, but it is a good thing. And then part of their message is, is and any hurt or heartache or disappointment you have, God is just going to put his hand on you, and he's not only going to heal that, but he's almost going to erase that from your life, and you can still be happy. You can get over that stuff. Now, again, I think we ought to get past our hurts and heartaches and disappointments, and they're a real part of us, and there's a challenge and struggle that comes with that, and God wants to use those heartaches to help us grow and, and be a way that, that we turn a hurt into helping somebody else. I, oh, I get all that. I think that's true. But God is not going to just kind of, because you have faith, just wave some little wand over your head and stick you in a little bubble and nothing bad's ever going to happen to you. And then this week, the controversy is around some comments that Victoria made in August about the reason we worship, the reason we come together to sing and praise God is to feel good about ourselves. And that's not biblical. And I heard a great response to it. A gospel message that can't be preached in the slums of Mumbai. If it doesn't work there, it shouldn't be one that we preach in the streets of the USA. That God is not inviting me to be happy. In fact, the opposite, really. He's inviting me to be disturbed by the stuff he's disturbed by. To care about the stuff he cares about. And to find ways for me to get engaged. And just because I can't do everything doesn't mean I don't do something. When I first came here years ago, what I wanted to do was build the best church in the community if I could. I wanted to have us have the best children and the best worship and the best student stuff. I, don't, I, I, I hope we still do things well. I want that. But about 16 years ago, we made a shift and we didn't want to be the best church in the community. I wanted us to grow into the best church for our community. And there's a difference in that. There's a difference in how we spend resources. There's a difference in how we see ourselves. There's a difference in what we're about. I think gathering together like this matters, but scattering matters just as much. And maybe you and I should quit coming to church and start being the church. In other words, this isn't about a list I'm checking off and I go home feeling good. Hey, I did the church thing this week. Because God's inviting me to love him and love my neighbors. And it should drive me towards the things he cares about. And so social justice matters. 
And over the next few weeks, this month, this is a great month for you to invite your friends, by the way. Next week, we're going to talk about uh, stuff we've done with disaster recovery and why that matters. Not just helping out, but why the long-term stuff that we've done, not just here, but in other places around the world. Is, and, and then the following week, we're going to talk about orphans. And a huge passion is we, we want to eliminate orphans in the world. And we're partnering with a lot of things uh, around the world to do that. But particularly here in the state of Colorado, there's some substantive things happening that our church is engaged in. And you want to hear that weekend. Then the last week we're going to talk about a big deal social issue going on. That's single parent households and the tremendous challenges of that. Why as a church we want to get engaged because it has to do with at-risk kids and we care about at-risk kids. And just because we can't do everything doesn't mean we aren't going to do some things. Because God's inviting me to get engaged in the, in the stream going by the front door. A friend of ours, Bob Moffat, wrote a little book called If Jesus Were Mayor, What Would Your City Look Like? What would he do about... Uh, uh, orphan kids, what would he do about uh, shelter and housing and water and jobs and, and people that live below the poverty level? If Jesus were mayor, it's a great question because he's invited us to be his hands and his feet. You remember what he said? I, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and you didn't take care of me. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, dude, what, when did we see that? Because <laughs> I mean, if we'd seen you like that, And you and I are going to get in our cars today, and we're going to drive home, wherever home is around the area. And if we open our eyes, we're going to see it in a lot of places. So through the prophet Amos, God says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I, I won't accept them. And though you bring the choice fellowship offerings, I have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I don't want to listen to your music anymore. Let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never-ending stream. And I want us to have a biblical faith that loves God and loves our neighbors. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your grace, that, that you do invite us to be changed. And Lord, we don't get it right a lot, and I'm grateful when we gather, and what, what I get out of that, but Lord, I want it to be more than that. I want it to be how you invite us not just to get, but to give, that we've been saved from something for something. Help us to have your heart, your eyes. We pray in Christ's name.